Hello everyone. My name is Ashfaq Ahmed. I'm a PhD and postdoc and working as an assistant professor of bioinformatics. Today, I'm going to start a new series for phylogenetics. It may include two or three videos, or but the first video, I mean this video, it will be all about introduction to phylogenetics and under understanding phylogenetic tree. Why it is important? It was so easy for me just to give you a direct video uh, where I teach you how to uh, construct a phylogenetic tree, but that will not work for you because if you are not able and if you are not able good enough to understand how these th these things are working, how you have to analyze the tree, how you have to read the tree, all these things are in vain. So th that's why it is important that uh, before moving to the second video uh, for tree construction strategies, uh, you have to understand this video. So it's a kind of introductory lecture and that will tell you all about the uh, takes and talks, do's and don'ts of phylogenetic trees. So let's begin. First of all, you should know phylogenetic tree actually it's the representation of a field which we call phylogeny. So what is phylogeny? Phylogeny will tell you or phylogeny explain the evolutionary relationship among different organisms. It could be sequences, it could be some other fossil records, or it could be the whole organism. So, uh, but you have to select some data set that will represent that organism. But how you will analyze the phylogeny, we will take help of phylogenetic tree. So what is phylogenetic tree then? Actually, it's a tree-like structure and it may be bigger or smaller depending upon your data set, but it will tell you the evolutionary relationship of your um, taxa. You will learn what is taxa later on. But here you have to, to, to I, I'm going to introduce you that what kind of data you can use for phylogenetic analysis. You can use morphology, morphological data, in the data from the fossil records, you can use embryological data or embryo, uh, from the field of embryology, or you can use some DNA, RNA, or protein sequences. So these three things you can mainly people are using these three kinds of data uh, to to tell or to interpret the evolutionary rela relationship between different organisms. So first of all, uh, what are the basics of phylogenetic tree? So phylogenetic tree actually it indicates the nature of a species or the nature of a population or the nature of a sequence I would say at a given time. If you are doing some analysis today, it means you are comparing the current day or the modern day or the today sequences with the previously known sequences. So uh, that's why I use the word at a given time. So you you have to uh, generate some data sets and then data sets will be mapped or drawn on the phylogenetic tree and the phylogenetic uh, tr what you should know about the phylogenetic tree further the phylogenetic tree actually that is working on a hypothesis and the hypothesis is that that it, that, that it will explain the evolution or the history of evolution for a particular organisms so currently in world people are using a uh, phylogenetic tree and it is acceptable in science uh, until and unless you explain it in the right way because if you just a phylogenetic, uh, if you just draw a phylogenetic tree, and if you don't have the proper right uh, interpretation or representation, and or if you even don't know how I drawn this and why I have drawn this tree, so that will not make any sense. So you have to learn these things first. That 
uh, what are phylogenetics trees how to interpret and blah blah let's see move on so first of all we will talk about taxa or taxon taxon is a singular and taxa is a plural what are taxa taxa are actually um, the names are i would say the identification of those species are actually those species which you are studying for example you are studying dna or protein sequences so it will be the name it will be your first sequence second third fourth fifth sixth represented by a taxon a b c d e and f so this portion will be called taxa we will also call o t u operational taxonomic unit and these positions will be called external nodes on the other side there are also some nodes like this one this one this one this one these are nodes and we will call it internal nodes or h t u hypothetical nodes hypothetical taxonomic units they may not be true but they, they, that's why we call it a uh, hypothetical taxonomic unit and later on there is a slide so i will tell you why we call it hypothetical taxonomic unit so and if uh, if two taxas sharing the same ancestor like this one so we can analyze or we can uh, report it or we can call it a sister taxa not a brother taxa i will mind it we will call it a uh, sister taxa so let's move what are clades there is another term you will use it or people will use it during the interpretation and we call it clade so what actually are clades if you see in the picture uh, you may see four you should see one two three four colors yellow cyan uh, green and red so now just uh, focus on these pictures if this is taxa one taxa two both the, both of them share the same ancestor now include this one taxa one taxa two taxa three they share the same ancestor here if you talk about this so both these two taxa taxa one taxa two they share the same ancestor here and they, they are colored separately or even if you consider the whole tree they share the same ancestor here so by definition a clade is any taxon any number of taxon could be three four five six or many more but they share a common ancestor so it you can call it a clade so in the given picture it could be clade one it could be clade two it could be clade three it could be clade four but uh, it is up to you according to the interpretation that how many clades you want to study and which clade you want to prefer and which clade you want to ignore okay so talking about the clade there are some there are clade we call it true clade or we call it monophyletic group but there are clade we uh, we call it paraphyletic group or polyphyletic group what are true clades or monophyletic group those texas which contains a common ancestor and all of its descendants will be called a true clade like here this is a true clade you see it has three texa a b c and all of them contain a common ancestor here so the common ancestor is present and all the descendants is present so it's a true clade if you talk about this one it will be also a true clade if you talk about this one specifically it will also be a true clade so what are paraphyletic group so paraphyletic group are those groups uh, which contains which has more than one if you, if you read it which has a common ancestor but does not contain all of the descendants if you see here it has taxa 1 taxa 2 taxa 3 and taxa g this one g taxa is out of the clade i mean someone has not selected so uh, why at times at times uh, when you draw your phylogenetic tree and if this is your sequence g 
so you don't want to mix it with them you want to separate them because of some features some characteristics so you just mention this clad and in that case you will not call it a paper clad you will call it that a g lies in this cluster which is actually making a paraphyletic group so a uh, paraphyletic group will be that group which contains the evolution uh, ancestor but it is missing some of the taxa so that will be called a paraphyletic group but here polyphyletic group the classical definition is that it does not have a unique common ancestor yes this is true for this part a unique common ancestor is this but how about c for c this is not a common ancestor for c but due to some reason in analysis if you have included this c that will be called polyphyletic group i hope uh, i have made it clear okay so there is uh, another thing i want to uh, just discuss it i i skipped it here by definition or by natural way a node should be divided into two but it's not the right way to say a node should be bifurcated into two lineages or into two branches okay you can see here you can see here but in some cases it also bifurcated not bifurcated actually in this case it is trifurcated in some cases it is it it arises into more than two branches so what you will call it so to that that kind of scenario we will explain it as a polytomy polytomy so uh that was the definition of polytomy okay a classical tree should have nodes we talked about nodes and we and it should have some branches okay so doesn't matter if it, if it is this kind of representation or if it is this kind of representation they have branches they have nodes so there are two kinds of nodes one will be inter internal node or something in external node so i told you already the external node will be called otu and they will be on the external side on we also call them taxas and the internal nodes are this one this is internal node this is internal node this is internal node this you 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 can see this structure and they are actually called htu because they may not be the real representation of real organisms so you can say it's some missing links in the data that will be the right explanation or interpretation so that's why we we, we call it htu hypothetical uh units or hypothetical taxonomic unit and branch what will be the branch branch will be the region or the space that connects to internal node like this is branch and this is branch okay so i already talked about this the internal node the hypothetical ancestral taxa sequences that are, that are h to u and uh, blah blah okay this will be called a root the final ancestor that will be called a root okay and that actually tells you that this data which you have you have selected this here is the root that actually tells you that all these organisms all these organisms they belong to the same root or the same ancestor okay so what is what what's about this root which organism is, organism is this we will talk it later okay there is another uh, thing you should know there are two kinds of trees based on the topology topology is actually the overall representation of tree this is unscaled topology and this is scaled topology this is scaled topology this is unscaled topology how you should know there are two things to differentiate between scaled topology and unscaled topology topology is actually the the, the tree pattern or the representation so if you see here all the branch lengths are similar i mean uh, 
A, B, C, all these texts are in the same line. They are aligned. You may not see that A is here or D is here. So the same branching pattern you call we call it unscaled tree. But for scale tree, if you if you see here the same tree, A is here and D is here. So if a tree has a different length, that will be called scale tree. And the second um, identification is such kind of tree will show this kind of scales. So a tree with scale is actually called a scale tree. Okay. And how the scaling is decided? I mean, how it is decided that C is here or G is here, A is here or D is here. It, it actually decide based on the number of differences. For example, if you look to this slide, for example, we have uh, two sequences, sequence A and sequence B. If you see both the sequences, if you look to both the sequences, there are two, I would say, mutations, substitutions of the, the, the right way, the proper way. So there are two substitutions this and this this and this with this positions and how many total positions are one two three four five six seven eight nine ten so both the sequences have ten positions where two of them are substituted or different you may say are mutated whatever you say so how the branch between a and b will be decided to to keep it very simple number of substitution divided by the overall length so it has two substitution divided by 10 the overall length is 10 so that will be 0.2 so the distance between sequence a or the branch length i would say not that uh, the distance is also right way but we are discussing the branch length so the branch length is actually 0.2 remember it is the branch length that will tell you the rate of evolution that which sequence has experienced more evolution and which has experienced less evolution as compared to the other sequence okay uh, one thing i i talked about topology the overall representation i talked uh, okay i you should also know there are two other uh, phenomena which we call it unrooted and rooted tree a tree having no clear cut root or clear-cut ancestor or if you are unable to 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 find out which one should be a proper uh, a proper ancestor so you you will call it uh, unrooted and i'm sorry i forgot to mention some picture uh, here but uh, that's not a problem you can search on the internet and you can have many many pictures of unrooted tree but what are rooted trees? So a rooted tree must have a uniform uh, ancestor at the end. But there is one, uh, I, I, I question you in the previous slide that how will you know that which organisms, which insect, which sequence is this one? If, if it's a root, so which sequence is this one? So there comes another definition, we call it outgroup. So whenever when we draw an, uh, a, a rooted tree, so we normally select one taxa as a root. But how we select the taxa as a root, or we call it outgroup, how we select? It's a good question. So we select based on the literature. For example, for example, if you are studying coronavirus, so the out root will be the sequence emerged from Wuhan in 2019 because everyone knows the literature is consistent they are agreed that this was initially the the first sequence of coronavirus uh, that was sequenced in 2019 so in that case you have to select that sequence if it is uh, included in your data as an out group so the program will uh, you the program will make a tree originated from the uh, out group <coughs> okay so I hope that's clear okay now there is another thing uh, another uh, common thing you should know about anagenesis and cladogenesis 
uh, many people are not uh, familiar with this thing what are anagenesis and what are cladogenesis but that is very simple for example uh, so far you I have tried to give you a, a common idea that actually the phylogenetic analysis is dealing with the evolutionary changes or it deals with evolution over time okay so what is anagenesis for example it's a it's a you consider this this parrot was present in in the world in 1980s but in 2023 we we are not seeing this parrot but we are seeing this kind of parrot we have the population of this parrot we do not have the population of this parrot so what does it mean it mean that during the course of time this species has evolved to this one or speciated to this one okay so such kind of evolution we will call it anagenesis but for example the same parrot which was present in two th in 1990s uh, so 80s but it's also present in 2023 but there is also a new species which was not present which was not reported anywhere uh, with a longer tail in 1980s so it means this new species emerged from this species okay so in this case we will call it cladogenesis remember in the case of anagenesis the former species has to extend it has to be disappeared so if the former species is disappeared we will call it anagenesis happened but if the former species is present we will call it cladogenesis okay so it's the same uh, i explained this uh, already it's about cladogenesis now you while dealing with phylogenetics you should know about the homology or the homologies okay what is actually homology so in, in simple terms homology means when two or more organisms or when two or more sequences or when two or more uh, species when you are in your subset if they are sharing some common features if they are sharing some common uh, properties i would say so we will call them homologies for it but um, i know most of the student uh, listening to me or most of the people listening to me they are dealing uh, with sequences so therefore i will talk about the these these uh, dna sequence so for example we have two sequences one and two so you you just uh, assume that some endel operations has happened which uh, delete g from this sequence and which insert gta to this sequence and so these two sequences became like this over time so and once we when we align them the alignment will look like this it means it's a classical example of endel operation insertion and deletion so the gta was inserted in this sequence and the g was deleted from this sequence so and all the colored things are those identities which are shared by the two sequences so if you observe if you interpret this figure in the uh, in the in the form of phylogenetic analysis let's interpret it like uh, I, if i would say 10 years before these two sequences was like this but now after 10 years they are like this so now the question comes here that if we perform alignment so how should we know what two sequences are homologue and what two sequences are nowhere near to homology or they are not homologues so here also the con here also the concept comes up paralog and uh, ortholog uh, etc etc but in this video i will not go there so you can uh, watch it for you can read it for yourself so the answer to this question i have um, generated is if the similarity in case of protein i would say but i would use the word identity so if the identity between two sequences is more than 25 percent in that case we will call them homologue but now another question comes for example we have two sequences 
they have the identity of 30 person and we have another two sequences they have the identity of 90 person so are both these sets are homologs yes both they are homologs but the latter one which shares 90 percent are closely related homolog and the 30 percent set they are distantly related homologs i hope i made it clear okay now uh, you should also know about the molecular clock what is molecular clock clock it's actually a hypothesis and that state that among the closely related species or i would say that state that among genes which you all know that course proteins among genes uh, there comes evolution there comes changes there comes mutation so but with time those mutation they are not just spontaneous and they are not just irregular because uh, if you remember the darwin theory that says uh, that they talks about the uh, pressure and selectivity by the environment evolutionary pressure and selectivity so the environment will only select the one which favors the environment so that's another story i don't want to dig there but to understand the molecular clock hypothesis simply it states that a closely related species a given in a closely rela related species a given gene usually evolve it reasonably at constant rate remember at constant rate that means these evolutions are not spontaneous they are not irregular they they, they are some in in some constant way they are evolving and these mutations these events can be used so if we believe or if we assume that these mutations are at constant rate that have that that i would say if uh, if they they are happening periodically or at a constant rate so it means we are able we 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 are able to calculate time from between the two species if we know that at what rate these evolutions or these these changes are uh, happening so the answer is very simple then we can calculate the time between two species so that is actually the molecular uh, clock hypothesis which dealing or which is uh, that is explaining but it's still an uh, a hypothesis so but you should know the molecular clock hypothesis that how should it work okay uh, let uh, let me give you an example for example this is hemoglobin and uh, it's the data from 5 million year 500 million years sorry on the x axis and this is the amino acid sequences so if you see uh, it's reasonably at some constant pattern or it's constant rate these are actually the mutation or the changes that has happened so someone has grouped all this data so in that case uh, uh, now move to this example Th this is quite different and quite interesting uh, interesting uh, we have an HIV that is a virus so the virus actually the HIV emerges it's in 1930s and 40s here and then it really jumps up in 1960s so we are now in 2023 so that, that means we, we are dealing not with, with a so, so much big time in millions so what has happened when someone observed so it was found that the evolution or i would say the mutation rate was very higher than the, the normal organism like uh, eukaryotes like hemoglobin we, we shared above so it has two reasons because virus do not have a sophisticated system like us like eukaryotes second it is retrovirus uh, the retrovirus is actually as, as a simple uh, rna uh, if i'm not wrong so 
they are prone to much more higher uh, frequency of mutation so that's why the virus observe these mutations so quickly and if I give you a, a more reasonable and practical example uh, so just think about coronavirus that came in 2019 and it spread it out and just almost uh, we we, we, we live in for five more years after the pa pandemic, corona pandemic, and now you just go there, Google there, you will see alpha, beta, omicron, BJ lineage, and uh, mu lineages. So from where all these come? They come from such kinds of mutations. So uh, my point is that actually, uh, viruses are prone to changes and they will give you more changes okay that's enough for today uh, that was all about the brief introduction i could give you in the coming video we will uh, move towards some practical uh, practical demonstrations of uh, what strategy to adopt how to adopt for your data set what which strategy you have to ignore uh, for certain data sets so all these things we will discuss uh, step by step uh, stay with me if you like my videos uh, please thumbs up subscribe and suggest my channel to other guys thank you so much you can drop your question uh, in the comment section uh, that's enough for now bye